There we go. Well, thank you very much. I uh, you may know that uh, Phil Blakey was chosen just last fall parliamentary parliamentarian of the year in Canada's parliament, uh, the NDP, longtime NDP deputy leader. Uh, overwhelming choice uh, because of his strong background and his strong, uh, strong abilities that he brings to Canada's parliament. I'd like to tell you about one of the top three parliamentarians, and that's Libby Davies from Vancouver East. Libby does an amazing job in the House of Commons. She's strong, she is articulate, and she does more work in the city of Vancouver than the other MPs combined. So Libby, you really are a tribute to Vancouver, and we thank you for all of your work. So the Security and Prosperity Partnership, so-called, AKA Deep Integration, AKA NAFTA Plus, AKA NAFTA on steroids. The SPP is essentially given as justification the next stage in integration between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So it's useful when we start talking about the SPP to look back over the last 20 years to see what exactly has happened economically in Canada. When I started just four years ago as trade critic for the NDP, I'd go to meetings of the Standing Committee on International Trade. And inevitably, there were corporate CEOs that were brought to testify before the Standing Committee on International Trade, and they all said the same thing. In their presentation, it would be yada, 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 yada. NAFTA has brought unprecedented prosperity to Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. One after the other, corporate CEO after corporate CEO. They all had the same phrase. Can NAFTA has brought unprecedented prosperity to Canada. Well, I asked these CEOs, what's your proof that this has brought unprecedented prosperity to Canada? And they would say, well, average income's up. I said, well, average income is uh, notoriously unreliable as a measure of economic well-being. So what has actually happened to various levels of the Canadian population, the poor, the middle class? And the corporate CEOs inevitably would look down their papers and shuffle their papers and say, well, well, we don't know. That's Statistics Canada. So we went to Statistics Canada and we asked them for the income figures from 1989 the year of the implementation of the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement through to present day. And StatsCan had a surprising response. They said, well, we gather those statistics, but we don't compile them and we don't publish them. <laughs> Hence started a one-year battle at the NDP to get those figures released to the public. Uh, last year we released them for the first time this in the fall of uh, 2007. We released the second annual study of what has actually happened since 1989. And I think for many of you in the room, these will not be surprising statistics, but they're important statistics to know. Since 1989, this is what has happened to Canada's population. The wealthiest one-fifth of Canada have seen their income rise remarkably, about 20%. In fact, that wealthiest one-fifth of Canadians now takes half of all income in Canada and now holds 75% of all wealth in Canada. So what's happened to the next income level, uh, the upper middle class? Well, they've stagnated. There's been no rise and no fall in their income since 1989. But the statistics become much more interesting as we move down the income levels. The middle class in Canada, the average family has actually lost a week of income for each and every year since 1989, since the implementation of the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. In other words, they're working 52 week years, only being paid now for 51 weeks. The income impact has been even stronger for the lower middle class, that next one-fifth of Canada's population. They've lost, on average, two weeks of income for each and every year since 1989. They're working 52-week years. Compared to 1989, they're only being paid for 50 weeks. And the income impact has been most dramatic for the poorest of Canadians. That one-fifth of Canadians, basically families earning less than $20,000 a year. For those Canadians, on average, the average family has lost a month and a half of income for each and every year since 1989. They're working 12-month years. They're being paid the equivalent of 10 and a half months over that period. In other words, they're now 
these days, basically going six weeks of the year with no income whatsoever, compared to 1989. So it's no secret why there are 300,000 Canadians sleeping out in our parks and our main streets of our country tonight. We have seen with the poorest of Canadians a catastrophic fall in income since 1989. So much for unprecedented prosperity in Canada. What we have actually seen is a massive shift into inequality in income, levels of which that we have not seen since the 1930s. For the wealthiest of Canadians, their income has skyrocketed. If you're a corporate lawyer or corporate CEO, you're doing better than ever before. But for two-thirds of Canadian families, as we go through the various income levels, their income has actually fallen, in many cases, catastrophically. And that explains why the debt level of the average Canadian family since 1989 has actually doubled over this period. Again, so much for unprecedented prosperity. And the income disparity is becoming most critical with the youngest of Canadians. Statistics Canada tells us that since 1989, most jobs that are created today are actually part-time or temporary in nature. They do not come with benefits. They do not come with pensions. Let's think about this for just a moment. We're mortgaging the future of entire generations of Canadians. Canadian youth who now get out of post-secondary education are training with record levels of debt, on average $26,000 of debt load, are now going on to a job market where the jobs pay much less at the entry level than they did before. And those jobs come with no pensions, with no benefits. So if they're lucky, in sub subsequent decades, they will pay off that student debt if they're lucky, even though we're seeing in the lower mainland of, of British Columbia now record levels of, of, of income required for housing, in some cases 75% of disposable income required for housing. If they're lucky, they'll exceed to housing. But what happens when they get to the age of retirement now when most jobs created do not come with company pensions?